This is a good moment to say hello to you guys uh, if you are on Twitter around the world. Uh, there are, of course, many of you listening to us in different time zones. Just uh, whilst we sound a little sleepy, perhaps, you might be in the middle of your day. But please come and say hello to us uh, on Twitter, at Ben Consti for myself, uh, at uh, Lovejoy for Peter Dumbreck. And uh, which handle do you want to be using, Jamie, or are you not on Twitter? I'm on, um, yes, I'm on J. Campbell-Walter, I think. Do you think? <laughs> Using it a lot, Mr. Cowalwater, then. <laughs> but do ask us questions. We'll do our best to uh, answer those questions. It's always a good moment, I think, in 24-hour uh, racing to have a chat and uh, define the finer points as we go through the remainder of the night. We've still got about two hours of night officially. Sun comes up at 7.43. And... Uh, it will obviously get a little bit lighter before that point, and we'll see a very heavy uh, sky and dew. Not the fog that perhaps was uh, forecast, but it is certainly heavy with moisture out there right now. As Ritzy uh, take a bit of a break and literally snatch half an hour of sleep before their next synth. Yellow flag flying at the first chicane. As Charlie Hollings has managed to get River, Red River Sport back to the pits. The tyre is just about still together, but uh, he's done a good job not to completely destroy the rear end on that because it's very, very close to falling apart. Yeah, a tricky one when you have a puncher. If you drive too fast, the tyre delaminates, and if it starts disintegrating and flapping around, it just destroys the bodywork, the floor, the diffuser, can do the rear wing, especially on a rear tyre. And uh, the tyre only takes a matter of seconds to change, whereas the uh, whole rear end of the car, the floor, the bodywork, etc., can take a good 20 minutes. There is the evidence and remnants of the accident that uh, befell the car a few hours ago. Absolutely destroyed that rear left panel. Uh, lots and lots of duct tape. The car looking very, very second-hand. It, um, it had a huge uh, frontal impact uh, in the night, uh, finishing actually our free practice session on Thursday evening. So they rebuilt the whole front end of that car uh, across uh, the night and across Friday, actually. Those mechanics have worked pretty hard. Already, so yeah. Between them and the iDeck mechanics, I would say those teams have, have done the most work to their cars. A question on the car 70, which is MR Racing. Uh, that retired when I was still awake, but I have not remembered why. Uh, left front suspension failure uh, for that car. So. Uh, uh, T-Burn 21, there is your answer. Garage door down, it is out the race, uh, and it had left front suspension uh, failure on that car. Yellow flag now uh, is down at the second of the Morsan chicanes. So we don't know what the yellow flag was for at uh, the first chicane, which came out a few moments ago. It cleared pretty quickly. This one seems to be hanging around a bit more, and that is the reason why. It is the graph car of James Allen pointing the wrong direction. Let's see why. Oh, just lost it. That car was leading, if we think back to the beginning of the race. Yeah. And James Allen was aboard that car when it was a leading. It did a great job, he did, uh, to hold off some incredibly experienced competitors. Really ruffled the feathers of Philippe Albuquerque, who just simply expected for it not to be there uh, when they were fighting in the first couple of hours. But uh, now, with the cycle of drivers in that car, you know, it's an endurance race with three drivers of three separate talents and speeds and feelings. Um, back in with James Allen now. A little mistake, but it didn't cost him too much. Uh, he'll carry on with that. And that was uh, that is actually on a new tyre as well. So I don't know if he's just come out of the pits or it's been a couple of laps, but his last pit stop was a full service. Richard Leitz running fourth in GT Pro. 
Porsche not really had the pace last lap, 3.54. Leaders last lap was 3.52. So um, still the Porsche struggling. I think it, it tends to be their straight line speed, maybe the speed out of the corners. Ferrari and Aston Martin pretty level, swapping position it seems every pit stop. There was a bit of speculation early on that some of the cars that were struggling with straight line speed carrying a bit more downforce, perhaps aiming for the wetter conditions in the race, and that was going to help them with stability when we got the rain. But for the moment, Porsche's weather forecast says no rain at all. So you're, you're actually seeing the lights of the second place car ahead, but uh, Richard Leet is a good couple of laps down, mm. or at least one lap down. Yeah, a couple of laps. Yeah, two laps, yeah. Pitches the car into this first part of the Porsche curves. That's the most fierce, most fearing part of it because the barrier there with no runoff area. We saw Alexander West go heavy into that ball. Thomas Laurent nearly did in the Signatech, but uh, it's probably my favorite it. part of the circuit that. Yeah, it's fantastic to drive so quick through there. Of course, it used to be a lot more narrow. You used to really feel constricted by the walls. Um, but gradually, as time's gone on and safety measures have uh, improved, the walls have been moved a little bit further back. If you remember, there's been some massive crashes through there as well, like Duval in the Audi springs to mind. Um, when was that? Four or five years ago? In practice, so we didn't, never got a clear uh, video of it. Mr. McNish has seen one privately from the uh, Commissaire race control camera, but uh, there were no cameras at that point of circuit to capture Loic's crash. Mr. McNish has crashed through there, I remember, in 2012. And I thought, oh, great. I don't want to wish bad on Mr. McNish because I knew he was okay, but I thought, all oh, right, because I was in the same race, and I thought, all right, we'll pick up a position on him here. They got that Audi back, they repaired the car in about 10 minutes, <laughs> and they still kept the lead over us uh, as we were in a, a private P1 car. Hello to Australia. Bunbury in Western Australia, Finlay. Uh, is still with us. Plenty of you uh, in the much more civilised uh, time zones right now. Michael Zed, he's in Australia after just three hours of sleep. What was the last... Uh, I'm afraid we're not going to be able to answer your question, but once Graham Goodwin comes back into the, uh, the box, we'll get that answer. When was the last time was a car got disqualified for outside assistance? The tricky one, actually, we're talking about the 37 car that uh, got restarted by the marshals, and uh, they fixed the car, having had major electrical issues. Well, he'd been handed something from outside the circuit, hadn't he? His, Is his that the reason why? had uh, given, given him a part or something to, to help get the car going, to get it back to the pits, yeah. and been spotted doing that, and then, yeah, they got, uh, they got disqualified. You can have advice, but you can't have parts or tools that's it yeah yeah all all, the, all these cars will have a tiny little toolkit in them which will uh, be a little bag rolled up screwdriver maybe a little hammer a couple of spanners uh, there's also a little special tool which uh, unclips the bodywork and sometimes when you have a, a contact with the wall you might have dislodged your uh, front end or rear end here you can see them here uh, to, to change it there's a couple of clips on the, above the front wheels and then those two tools that go in that comes off and then the new one goes on see the tools in the top there once it's located into the tub and it's a very quick change didn't look like the three car had any damage to the nose of its car. It may well be that there's a slightly different setup on that nose. The drivers could have been complaining of setup and they just decided to uh, make some changes, some downforce changes on board with the 22. Now we saw the 32, it's just come back out of the pits. That was not a scheduled stop. Ah, He's okay. only done six laps. And as we know, we can do 10 laps in a stint with this, these cars. So. 22 takes the lead again. A lot of oil on that screen, isn't there? Yeah, we heard him a few laps ago complaining about it. And maybe that's why they stopped. Yes. 
because the oil was being thrown out by the 32 car as he went by the 22 car. Yeah. Didn't see any kind of top up going on though on that pit stop. But we cut to it slightly later, perhaps, when maybe a, an extra bit of servicing had already been done. We've got Hayley Evans back in uh, the pit lane, so she will go and investigate. And uh, here is the radio from Philippe Albuquerque, uh, who's now back in the lead of the race, but probably struggling with vision. <laughs> Screen, <laughs> screen is really bad. I yeah, think you can said, see yeah. that, can't you? Yeah. It's a right mess. And it really will be blurring his vision. It looks awful from where we are. It um, won't be quite as bad as uh, the camera always makes it seem a bit worse. But yeah, that's not going to be uh, very pleasant to drive like that. And, you know, he, it takes a bit of getting used to. You know the situation when you've been driving through the continent, it's been a hot day, you've got plenty of bugs all over your windscreen, and then somebody hits the windscreen wiper and yeah. smears it across the screen. And it just is horrible until you get, can get into a service station and give it a proper scrub. I tell you what, it'd be an absolute nightmare for him if it started to rain. Oh, yeah. Absolute nightmare. Oil and water on a windscreen, he would not be able to turn his wiper on. And lots of rookies, something you don't never really think of because it's not something in the book, but a rookie would <laughs> turn his wiper on and I can't see anything. <laughs> um, so it's... Uh, and you're talking about bits that the cars will carry. Uh, back in your day, you carried mobile phones, when even when mobile phones weren't a thing. Um, uh, uh, well, I think they still do, yeah? because uh, they carry two things, a phone and a, a longer, or it's an extension of uh, their radio kit. So you see them plugging in in the pit stops. There's a, an extension so that they can remain on the radio and walk around the car with a <coughs> sort of three or four meter curly-whirly telephone cable type thing. Um, and they can receive instructions then on their, um, on their headset. Let's go down into Kazuki Nakijima's eight Toyota, leading the race by a lap. <laughs> Okay, coming into the pits, pit confirm. Now, what is pit confirm? We always hear it in all different forms of racing. They, he's, he's being told that he's coming into the pits, but he has to send a signal back to the engineers? Just to confirm you've heard the message. Okay, That's and that all it is. It's simply a signal to say, I'm good, I'm ready to go. Yeah, so they'll say, box this lap, box this lap, and they expect, if they don't get a response within a... A few five, seconds. Five, yeah. five seconds or something, they'll repeat it again. Yeah. Uh, so maybe this is more of a clue as to what they might do to the car. Maximize kinetic. And then Kazuki saying, I'm in the pits already. Here he comes then, the leader of this 24 hours of Le Mans with uh, over 15 hours gone. And this will be a potentially full service. Well, Kazuki's halfway through his um, stint at the moment. He's done two stints. He's going to do another two. OK. 11 laps per stint. There are tyres sitting on the apron, but whether they actually end up on the car, we'll have to wait and see. You'll, you'll find there'll always be a set there just in case. Yeah, if they spot something on the tyre that the driver didn't feel. There we go. getting tyres. So a double stint on those Michelins. And is it going to be a full set? We've seen some teams doing just left sides. That's been only really the Porsche, hasn't it? The, the, the GT Pro Porsches. Um, you, you, you often see every stop, if they're not planning to change tyres, a Michelin man or a Goodyear man will go around looking top of those big holes and uh, maybe take temperatures uh, with a little probe um, and they give the thumbs up, which means you don't have to change it. And they do that whilst the fuel's going in, of course. For the number eight car, there's no point in taking any risk. No, exactly. You know, they've, got, they've got enough tyres, they may as well use them. But it was a 120 stop, so that seems quite fast for a full tyre 
service. And I think we only saw the left side tyres being done there. Now, a tyre graphic will confirm once it gets updated with all the information that it picks up when those cars uh, leave the pits. Although it has been wrong already. We did have a look earlier on and it suggested that uh, uh, they had had an issue with the front left, but they, uh, the team uh, confirming that they had not. On board with Signatech Alpine. And now they were locked in a battle last time we checked with them. And uh, at the moment they are 1 minute and 22 seconds off uh, eighth position with René van der Zander in the Dragon Speed 27 car to win that position. They were battling with Cool Racing, but Antoine Borgo has got up to seventh position and Signatech down to ninth. So uh, that was a couple of hours ago, mind you. Thank you very much to Desert Jester, who is uh, joining us, and Philip Pond, uh, who is also on the beers, keeping himself awake. Now, here's one for delving into your computer, Peter. Do we know how many hours the bronze drivers in GTM have done from the top five? Let me have a look, so... Another one from Kaz, as uh, Peter works on his numbers. This one's an easy one for Jamie Campbell-Walter. What is the small canister they seem to pour into the car at sometimes during pit stops? It's oil. So it's a pre pressurised canister, uh, just for a quick fill, basically, uh, rather than gravity, and they're just topping up the oil. So the engineers at the back of the uh, pit garage will be... Uh, there'll be some guys from the engine... Uh, department who will be keeping an eye on pressures, water pressure, oil pressure, and uh, the minute they start to see a drop, these cars under high G loads in the, in the Porsche curves, they will see a drop, slight drop in the oil pressure. That is a sign that the uh, car is slightly low on, on oil, and what they'll do is have preset determined sort of times more or less where they add the oil, and they're just putting in like half a litre to a litre, it's not very much. Of course, the other bottles that are there is a, a driver uh, drinks bottle that can be replaced as well. And we'll see the, on some of our onboard cameras, you can see the silver canister uh, that gets replaced sometimes. Right, I've got an answer to your question. You know, the only team that isn't really using its arm driver in GTM at the moment is the leading car. Okay. Hence, hence their big lead. Yeah, so they're... they're He's not wanting to drive in the dark. So they are going to be disadvantaged yep. later on. And uh, That being uh, Sally Ulick. Yeah, and then uh, Augusto Farfus and um, Ross Gunn will come into play. Yeah, because Paul Danilana, their gentleman driver, is in the car right now. Yeah, and that, that car was leading, let's not forget. The Aston Martin Racing one of Delalana was leading. Now a minute and 32 behind. Delalana is the bronze. Um, so, and, and he's doing a great job. I mean, a 3.58, that lap is a respectable lap time. You know, this guy's a very wealthy businessman, good driver, nearly won the race. Uh, WEC champion, of course, as well. And uh, sort of respected as, as one of the best bronzes, actually, yeah, in, in GT. So. He's pretty good. And he's a big, big lad as well. Oh, yes. But he's a super nice guy and, a, and actually a, a very good driver. On board with Paul Lafarge. Now, that doesn't seem right to me. The t t strobing disco lights going on inside uh, the IDEX Sport machine. Can't see exactly where that's coming from. Does look like it's coming from the front left, uh, which usually would be a G sensor for uh, in term, if there was an impact on the car, it would, it would uh, turn on. So. Another stock part from uh, the electronics manufacturer that is faulty. We saw it with Sophia Flersch in practice. Her uh, race control screen was flicking on and off, but that must be horrible for Lafarge to have that flashing consistently inside the cockpit, effectively in his eye line as well, Peter. Yeah, I, I think I wouldn't enjoy that. I mean, once you, once you focus outside the car, 
in the distance, you're not seeing it so badly, but uh, it certainly would have an effect. Where did, what, where's that flashing light coming from? Well, I think it might be the, um, the automatic FIA safety sensor for in, if there's an impact of over a certain G. Mm. We saw it on the uh, Alexander West uh, Ferrari when he went into the wall. Uh, it comes on and basically tells the marshals that the car has experienced a, a high G-force. On board with Felipe Albuquerque. 45 seconds to the good now at the moment. And how is he getting on with that horrible screen? Felipe really sounds like he's desperate to get out of that car, doesn't he? End of a triple stint. Uh, a little confused as well as to where his opponent is. Well, he didn't. He, he, obviously, there was that unscheduled stop by the um, by the 32 car, and uh, I don't think Felipe knew about it. So he thought the the 32 was still in front of him. Yeah. We talked about this earlier about engineers just keeping drivers informed. You, he's got no idea. He can't see the car. Can't there's see no much. There's <laughs> no information for him, and. Unless the team and the engineers inform him, you, your sister car's had a problem. He's pitted out of sync. Oh, no! Uh, oh, nearly, nearly tangled with a GT car, but... Uh, and he's coming to the pits. So he's got no idea. So he's just like, where, where, are the other, you know, where are the other cars? Tell me. You're doing a great job, mate. You're in the lead. So um, the engineer said as well, you, could, you, know, you should do one more if you can. Yeah. Sounds as though he's going to stay in for one more stint. No, I think it was one more lap. He said, will it make I a see. difference if I come in now? And the engineer said, you really should do one more if you can. Now, that message could have been replayed. One, yeah, could so have been one lap ago. <laughs> yeah. You can see if uh, he's yeah. done the full he's, stint or he's, un he's unplugged his lid. So, uh, yeah, he's getting out. And this... Now, look at the windscreen that desperately needs to be cleaned. New, this tear-off comes tear off. off. That That... The car has also got an internal flashing light. That's a See, pink can, internal light, though. Yeah. Is that just for in the pits, though? It did seem to come on when they hit the pit speed limiter. Phil Hansen getting in. He's the uh, silver driver in the car, but uh, a very good one. So, yes, I remember Hansen getting in the car last time in the darkness. Yep. So this is his second time of driving in the dark. We should see... He's going to drive into the daylight. He though. will drive into the, day, the daylight, which is, is a nice feeling. Yes. And it's, it's uplifting because it's like, well, we've, it feels like you've almost made it. Yes. You haven't, but it kind of has that feeling about it. Well, well, daylight here at 7.30 and the race finishing is at 2.30. There's a f much less race left. Uh, when it is daylight, yeah. yeah no, normally it's on. sort of five in the morning, isn't it? Uh, and you've got to go till 3.30, so yeah. um, still a long way to go. But uh, how, how, how long have we got? Eight and a half hours to go. Bear yeah, that's in mind, weird. Uh, that, would, that would be daylight in a usual June yep. race. Yep. We, we would be daylight now. Um, eight and a half hours is still a wet race, plus two and a half hours to go. So anything can happen still. Having a look at Jota doing a full service on the 38. They're the only other car, other than the two United Auto Sports machines, that are on the lead lap for LMP2. And they have had a few maladies, so they're slightly off uh, touching distance right now. New, tires changed. New good years going on. Anthony Davidson getting in. Really, really good feelings for Goodyear to know that they are well up there. Uh, Panis Racing also using the Goodyear tyre in fourth position. So despite being new to Le Mans, they are developing something which is equal, if not better, depending on the, the conditions uh, to the Michelin tyre already. Yep, and right, right up there, um, 
able to pick up the pieces if United stumble. Jota and Palace, third and fourth place. Anthony Davidson with huge experience here at Le Mans, LMP1 for Peugeot, for Toyota. He's not taken an overall victory, though. He's missed that uh, accolade, hasn't he? Yeah, he's, I mean, he's, he's been in yeah, two, two teams, two cars that really could have, would have, should have yeah. won it and didn't. Um, so he's been unfortunate. He's, you know, the years I remember him being super, super quick and just being that little bit unlucky, the car being unlucky and uh, him not getting the win. First visited Le Mans in 2003, driving a GTS Pro Drive. With Darren Turner, I believe. Yeah. That would make sense. In fact, Kelvin Burke was in that car as well. Next, after his stint in Formula One, 2009 for Aston Martin. And then joined Peugeot for their campaigns in 2010 and 11 before switching to Toyota in 2012. But uh, I think they're the eyes of James Hansen. Oh, the problem with that door. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the first issue was that he got his glove stuck in the door, and then he wasn't massively confident that yeah, he's, he shut. he's triple double checking, checking that. And now, 32 in again. Is that a full, a full stint? That doesn't seem right, that they're back on to sync with each other. Oh, Graham Goodwin's been over messing with my computer here. Best result, by the way, for uh, Anthony Davidson at Le Mans was P2 in 2013. He got one other podium, only one other podium at Le Mans. For all of that experience over those years, that's quite remarkable. So that is, it does seem a bit strange. So he's done a six and a five lapper. So when he, came in, when he came in, uh, probably to check that oil issue, they didn't refuel him. Okay. And he didn't give him any more tires. And uh, it was a quick in and out. And that is the resumption of, of his... Uh, yeah, but would you not? If you've gone and filled everything up, you brought the car into the pits, why don't you fill it up with fuel and at least do a full stint? Yeah, I'm surprised. I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. So the, can they only do half a stint with the issue with this oil? That uh, Well, we're speculating about the issue with the oil. We saw it on Albuquerque's windscreen. We'll know in 10 laps' time. Well, we'll know in five laps' time if he has to come in again. <laughs> True, yeah. And that's certainly one for Hayley Edmonds of the pits to go and investigate if United are forthcoming with the information. But uh, only able to do half a stint at the moment. Something that we saw from uh, G-Drive by Algarve. That was a fuel pickup problem for them early on in the race. They have now retired, by the way. But uh, concern then for what effectively is our class leader in LMP2 right now. But with all of these extra pit stops, is definitely handling the advantage uh, to the 22 of Phil Hansen. At the moment, they could manage it, and they do have a full lap advantage over Panis Racing in fourth position. So the 32 would only really lose one position if it had to do a slightly longer stop. But ultimately, with a, if it is an oil leak, an oil leak's not an easy thing to fix, where, regardless of where it is. Yeah, it all depends on what kind of oil it is. If it's yeah. oil from the engine, then yeah, we've got a problem, but it, it could be a fluid from another place. But we would see smoke out of the back of the car if it was oil from the engine. So it's it's probably not that. Could have overfilled it, couldn't they, when they yeah. put oil in, maybe, and uh, the oil's just come out the breather, because didn't he, they follow each other out the pit lane? Yep. And he had it for the whole stint, so... Yes, but he's only done two five-lap stints since. 
A six and a five. Haley yeah. was on her way to United, wasn't she? I hope so. Yeah. If she can hear us. So um, there's one thing going to the garage. There's another thing getting information for the team. That's uh, it's the second challenge. You can it, the easy bit is walking to the garage and uh, poking your head in. The hard bit is asking the team to find out exactly what's going on. Yeah, she just said she's at Toyota, so we, we bit of fitness for her. She can go back up to United <laughs> in a minute. Um, right, uh, I've had a wonderful time with you guys. Four hours at the, on the mic, and I'm going to sleep. No way. Enjoy. Which means Graham Goodman joins us and we can get super technical with all of your questions uh, oh, good on morning. Twitter. <laughs> that is a good morning to you, Graham. <laughs> uh, let's go down to Haley, who has some information on Philippe Albuquerque out of the car. Uh, a little bit uh, kind of, well, uh, by the end, seemed confused, Haley, because he, uh, he was all over the place by the end of his stint. Same. However, in the third stint, it was actually his teammates in car number 32 that were actually losing oil. And he said it became dangerous out there, and he just wanted to get back in because he didn't feel safe. So that's the reason why, as we all know, there's a big United battle going on up front. But, you know, he said he's just going to keep on pushing, keep on pushing. And uh, regardless of who is in front or behind him. <laughs> Yeah, the question mark is, though, is that a, an issue that could be managed or fixed at United Autosports for the 32 car? Uh, an issue for Philippe Albuquerque to have the oil on his windscreen. More concerning is if that's a problem with the 32 that's uh, 22. unfixable. 22. 32 has got the issue. But Albuquerque is not in... Sorry. Albuquerque was behind. Oh, I see. My apologies. I heard covered in it. oil. Right. Um, because he was directly behind coming out the pits and basically did a whole stint with his windscreen covered in oil. It was horrific. Lovely. And uh, Haley's saying that he felt it was a bit dangerous at times. He did complete it, though. He did he complete did, it. I mean, he had a little bit of a reassurance needed from the pits that he really does need to complete this stint. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he did oblige. He's now out of the car. He can have a bit of a rest. Phil Hansen back in the car. But, uh, yeah, attention on United Order Sports at the moment just to see if they can uh, get that 32 car back to a full 10-lap uh, stint rather than the five and the six that we've seen them do over the last two stints. Good morning, everybody. Hello there, Graham. No, my apologies. I, I gather you may have heard on mic, Jamie, just briefing me what's been going on for the three or four hours I've been attempting to sleep in a cardboard box. Have you managed it? Uh, what, sleeping in a cardboard box? Yeah, yeah a little of that, but uh, I think I've got my head around most of what's gone on. And uh, pretty clearly it's been an eventful last three or four hours. If they're not very good sort for some, and in particular the overall tone of this race for the number seven car, the cartoon anvil has fallen again. We're having lots of chats with Australia right now. Who are, are we? Anybody in particular? Enjoying us, uh, our stream on Twitter. Chris Sutherland says, any word from the drivers if a lack of night life, I'm not sure he means, if he means night life or night running, trackside has made it harder this year during the night or business as usual. Watching stateside, well done, boys. Nightlife as in campsite I I, fun? I, I, I suspect it's that because we talked, didn't we, in the night practice, Peter, about this lack of ambient light because we've not got some of the lighting at some of the corners. There's no fans out there in the campgrounds. So at certain parts of this track, the ambient light is less than they would have been expecting in previous years. That's right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all yeah, the whole race is that little bit darker this year. Um, yeah, it's it's a strange situation. I, I've kind of got used to it now that there's no, you know, normally there's that big wheel sitting out oh, there, yeah, isn't well, there? Well, not, well, not there anymore. It's over well, down yeah. there. But, but, you know, at this you can time, see it out of our window. Yeah. at 6 a.m. in the morning, I would be expecting to walk into the booth and the sun's already up yes, and exactly. it's just pitch black out there. I've just realised something. We missed all the fireworks during the, you know, midnight hours. You usually get fans throwing fireworks from the campsites and illuminating the sky. And to the point that we, you know, the lack of fans, we didn't have any fireworks. We had we Bruno didn't. van der Sticks talking to the fans that weren't here, but we didn't get any ASO, ACO fireworks. We should have had them put some on. 
<laughs> the ambience. Where have we had fireworks this year? Well, Bahrain usually have fireworks at the end of the race. There's been fireworks somewhere this year. It's too early to think about these things. <laughs> but uh, I used to love those. It's still got the atmosphere. Waking up and walking back towards the track and noise levels rising. And always good that you're not hearing too many occasions when the track falls quiet. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's always the time when you wake up, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> it doesn't feel right when it goes quiet. There's been a question come in, quite an easy one to answer, actually. I uh, can't find who's been asking it right e now. Easy for Jeffrey, Graham, anyway. <laughs> no, Jeffrey Kanza says, who makes the decision on retirements? And you do have to lodge or declare your intention. The god of racing luck. <laughs> <laughs> You have to declare that you are re retiring. You can't just you stop. Do. There is paperwork that needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, and yes, OK, there's some visual clues, like a car coming in with no wheels on it or, you know, upside down and on fire. We've mercifully not had any of those. But the, the garage door down is a very visual clue. That team will not be rejoining the race. But there is paperwork that must be filed. And that's the point at which you will see the, uh, the, the timing screens change and yes. uh, we get retired against that. And... You know, I know we've been wrong-footed at least once during this race with the number 88 car and the fantastic effort from Thomas Preining to get the car back from track summit after three hours. Uh, but, yes, it, it is uh, paperwork that's finally required. Yeah, that's an easy one. For so the answer you. is team manager, ultimately. Thank you, Jeffrey Kanza, though. Uh, oh, yeah, for, absolutely. For asking the question twice as well. Uh, yeah, Fee Miller reminds me, by the way, from the press room. Good morning, Fee. Kota. Uh, there apparently were some fireworks at Cota earlier this year, which was the last pre-lockdown uh, race meeting that the WEC had before we came back to racing at Spa. Also, Graham, can you remind us how many hours the arm drivers need to do in the GT I, class? I think it's six. six I think right, it's a minimum so six. Jamie did think it was six. So I yeah. think it's six in every class. I'll have a, have a quick look. There is a, there is a very neat little graphic that I can uh, drag out in a moment. Uh, that was what, by the way, I was so rudely peering over your shoulder earlier and trying to find out uh, through the strategy laptop and can't quite find the right button at the moment, but we'll grab that and sort out who's going to be short of them. Because the key to this, and one of the things we were just talking about off mic, was in the GTM class in particular, which gentleman drivers have been basically pounding around here in the full darkness. And I gather Paul Dallalan has been doing a fine yeah. job of that. So it's, it's only really Sally Yulik that Seems like he needs to get back in the car fairly soon well, to get some hours in. Which, therefore, is going to just tip the balance in a different direction to maybe where we've been so far. Yeah. And if we've got uh, cars on the same lap, but we do. So Ross Gunn has taken over the 98 car from Paul Dallalana. So he's on a very similar pace to Johnny, sorry, Johnny Eastwood. I know Johnny Eastwood because he's the uncle of Charlie Eastwood and I used to race against him in carts in 1986. Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was strange for me to, to see the name Eastwood come through and I thought, I wonder. And then I met his uncle uh, at Goodwood with Charlie it, and, it, and we remembered each other. Mo motorsport is the most incredibly family-based tribal thing and you find that constantly don't you 32 job van Otero has just managed to do his fastest lap of the race so far closing in on the 22 of philip hansen <laughs> yeah yeah, and it's not no longer, is it, eight seconds? It's down to 7.3 um, yeah, now. I'm, I'm not sure he wants to hear that. Yeah. But um, well, he probably does want to hear it, but he wants to go a bit quicker himself, I'm sure. But, you know, the important thing to do is to run your own race. They've, they've both had their little issues through the race. They're both on different strategies. Oh, dear. We've got a... Uh on the onboard on the 22 car, we've got the the old filmic effect of slightly wobbly cam. You can actually see it on the right-hand side there, just above the FIA screen, wobbling around and providing us a very cinematic wobble cam. Top Gear would be proud. So the answer on minimum driving time with, as always, our thanks to Fiona Miller, is indeed six hours is the minimum Frankly, whichever class you are, 
and whichever grade you are. Maximum driving time, oh, no, that's actually 14 hours is maximum. Minimum time, six. So, so you could actually get away with two drivers if, if you it's ended been, up. It's been done um, in extremis in the modern era from memory twice. Once was the bike collis car, which was effectively Andre Lotra's uh, arrival on the scene. Mm -hmm. When uh, one of his co-drivers fell off the pit wall on his way to the grid and dis dis dislocated his shoulder. So that meant that uh, I think it was... That was when they were running Audis, right? That's right. That yeah. was Andre Lotter and I think Charles Wellsman Jr. was that year. And the other one was actually, well, rather oddly, it was... I know what you're going to say, or if you're not going to say it, I'm going to tell you it. Go on. I do know this. It was Jeroen Blickemollen was the driver, um, and Ben... No, the tall... Who's the tall one that was his teammate? What? In what car? Um... We are it was an American. It was a pro, it was a pro speed Porsche, and uh, the option had to be taken. I think it was Brett Curtis had been injured in a shunt up at Dunlop, and they had to start with two drivers. Yes. I've got a feeling Cooper McNeil was Cooper one. Cooper McNeil, you are right. Yep. He's tall, isn't he? Yes, he is very tall. There you go. And um, they they actually did pretty well. They, uh, they ended up uh, getting into the, the race to do this. They had to put the car into GTE Pro, not GTM. And uh, to do that, because of the, the way the driving time mm. worked, and I have a feeling they finished something like fifth in class. Because I, I was looking through pictures on my phone, and I came across this picture of Jeroen Blickenmollen, and I took it before the race, and yep. I said, I'm going to take a picture of you after the race, because you're going to be driving a lot of time in this race. <laughs> That's it. There you go. So it's spot on. Another fastest lap for Jobban at in the 29.616. Wow. That might be one of the fastest laps we've seen from LMP2 overall. We'll have a quick look at that on the, the, uh, the laptop shortly as well. But there is movement in the garage, and I don't think either car owes us at this point a pit stop unless they still have an issue with that, with that 32 car and he's got to come in for another oil top-up. Well, all things being equal, I, I've found through this race, this duel, if you like, between Jan van Utert and Phil Hansen uh, is fascinating. They're the two silver drivers. There's a little bit of who's the daddy involved here at uh, United Autosports. Jan van Utert, uh, first year with the team. Both he and Philip Hansen, undoubtedly, at this stage, in normal times, would end up being gold-ranked drivers. Both wheel hands off the wheel there for uh, Phil. Yeah, he's playing around with his belts completely with no hands on the steering wheel. Let's hear what he has to say. His last lap was a 29.6. <laughs> yeah. uh, Excuse the language, but uh, Philip Hansen is a little surprised at the pace of the 32 behind. But look, the gloves are going on. Yeah. Now, what's he got in his hand? He's got a drill in his hand. Here we are on board with the 22. So, Philip doesn't want to be rattled here. He can clearly see the light's getting closer. Yeah, but I don't think he's going to be rattled. 3.1 seconds, but one of those cars is coming into the pits in a second by the movement in the garage. And I'm gonna guess, Peter, on your strategy laptop, that that's 32, it has to be. The 32 32's the only done five or six laps. Uh, 32's done four laps. Four, and the 22? Five laps. Yeah, exactly, so wow. neither are owed no, us indeed. a stop. There's something going on at, th at uh, United with the 32 car. Regardless, though, Phil, Phil Hansen does not like the fact that his teammate is so much quicker on the same track. Um, I don't know where they are tyre-wise. Oh, no, Hansen's on new tyres. So, yep. no, he's definitely rattled. Oh! Iron oh, Lynx, a... 75 smoking in the pit lane. Reno Mastronardi's brought that car in. And that does not look good. No, it doesn't. That doesn't look good at all. Uh, engine cover off. Never, ever a good thing in a 24-hour race. Something is very, very hot in there. The driver is out of the car. There is no driver in the car. And it's going up on the hijacks by the looks of things. Now, th th this is something we, we saw for a, a fair amount of before the Evo version of this car. There were, there were some reliability issues with that Turbo V8. But uh, it's not wanting to go up on its jacks either, is it? Well, the, the number one mechanic at the front of the 
car, making sure all the various jacks are in the right place before it goes on the high jacks. And uh, I think the thumbs up was, let's get it up high. So that car is going to be spending a while in the garage by the looks of things. It's 15th position uh, in GTM as it comes into pit lane. Right, so United Autosports 32 going past the pits with a 130.5. That's three seconds faster than uh, Philip Hansen. And on this lap, they are going to be absolutely locked together. There they, uh, no, not there they are, not quite. That's the Dragon Speed car of uh, René van der Zander in between them. But uh, only two seconds separate the two cars. And if they keep chumping away at the gap like that, then by the end of this lap, we'll have a change for the lead. But I'm still concerned about what's going on with that 32 car. Through first chicane goes Philip Hansen. And then into the first chicane comes Job Van Oterit. The two United Order Sport cars on the lead lap for LMP2 with uh, Anthony Davidson in the Jota just under a minute behind these two after various little maladies at Jota. There is a comparison of the two. Six laps for Philip Hansen, five laps for Job Van Oterit. And one of the very few 329s that we've seen uh, so far in this race from the LMP2 category. Through the traffic. Nice clear track ahead of Philip Hansen right now. 75 also reported for spinning in pit lane, which is unfortunate. I don't think that's the first time we've seen that from Rina Mastronardi either. But no, it's Claudio Schiavone, wasn't it? The 60 was much, much, much earlier in the race after the spin in front of us. The question is, if you're the manager, team manager of um, United Autosports, what do you do? Do you say, Phil, is a couple of seconds quicker th uh, than you at the moment? Just let him go and follow him, whatever. I certainly wouldn't want the guys to be taking major risks in the darkness right now. I mean, it's a kind of whole position, maybe. The, the point is, what we don't know is exactly what are the arrangements here. Remember, the, the cars are the same colours, but this is commercial as well as anything else. These are three guys in the 32 that have trained and have backers that are paid to be here. To win. And this, and they are not being paid to support Phil Hansen. No, exactly. They will want to win. And... Uh, uh, and I know the, these guys, and believe me, all three of them are very driven individuals indeed. Uh, Haley is uh, down at the Iron Lynx 75 car, uh, watching a very smoky Ferrari, Haley. Yes, that's correct. And I have Rina Nazionati just next to me with all his equipment on, obviously, looking extremely forlorn um, at the car number 75. Now, Rene, could you just tell us what happened? I don't know. I was out. Everything was going well. And uh, suddenly, uh, I got all the alarm coming out. And I had uh, I heard the big uh, hit from the, from the back. And the smoke started to come inside the car. So I had to stop and, stop and check before uh, breaking the engine. Thank you, Rene. Thank you very much, Torino Mastronardi and uh, so Haley. A fire. Uh, effectively, uh, yeah. 32 though in after what was this six laps we said? Right, let's watch exactly what's going on here. Right, so fuel feeling. goes in first. The dolly's there. The, that car's going in the garage. Oh no! The dolly is being. It's a look at the mechanic behind the fueler. He has got a dolly in his hand. This is the car, as you can see, that Alex Brundle has done six and a half hours in and was so mighty in, uh, both at the start of the race, making amazing passes, and in the night as well. But there is a little niggle going on with that car, which is not allowing them to do more than six laps. Philippe Albuquerque was saying it was oil coming out the back of the engine onto his windscreen. Let's find out what they do to the car when it goes into the garage. But that has handed a good advantage to the 22 sister car of uh, Phil Hansen. Rear wheels come off. That's going to allow them to get access to the rear uh, body work that come off. Job on Oiterit with the door open. Is he be jumping out the car? But rear wing comes off, rear bodywork comes off. 
and United Autosports set to work. Uh, immediately loses second place to the Jota Sport car and Davidson goes through is now 62 seconds back from the lead. So we're back into tie battle time. What? Lead, lead car in GT Pro, 97 Aston Martin in. Maxime Martin out of the car. And had, had an advantage of just over uh, 10 seconds in the battle between uh, him and the Ferrari, but it does ebb and flow depending on who's got the new tyre on. They're not on exactly the same strategy. There is a slightly cooling down 75 Ferrari and uh, coming into the pits, very smoky. Was there flame? Rina Mastronardi saying that there may well have been. Brave of them to pump the fuel into it as it was smoking along, but uh, no sign of flame itself. 98 being reported to be relatively slow exiting Arnage. That is Ross Gunn in the Aston Martin, who's dropped behind. That's not relatively slow, it's very slow. Yeah. 50 seconds slower in the second sector. That is a very slow. And dropped behind the 77 Dempsey Proton of Matt Campbell. So has lost second position when we were expecting that car to inherit the lead once Sally Yollock jumped into the TF Sport. Suspected oil leak. Unsurprising that that's what we're being told. Uh, suspected oil leak on the 32 car. So investigations going on. What they won't want here is if it's losing the level of oil that it seems to be, is for that to cause a fire. That's, yeah. that's what they're looking to avoid here, or indeed, catastrophic mechanical failure. So they're going to see, I'm guessing, if they can trace where that oil is coming from and see whether or not an easy fix is possible. They also don't want to be constrained to six lap stints as well if they need to come in and top it up every time. Yeah, so if it is six lap stints and that's the only problem, that's a fairly catastrophic oil loss, isn't it? The mechanics doing their thing. Taking the time to change the nose as well. Yeah. At the moment, uh, I couldn't see if driver in or out. Number eight, our leading Toyota comes in for a service. A reminder, it had some early maladies, but nothing as bad as half an hour in the pits with a turbo issue for the seven car, which has put that Toyota down into fourth behind the two rebellions. It was a puncture that the eight car had and then a slightly blocked right front uh, brake ducting, which ended up being fully changed under a safety car. Ten minutes in the pits, but uh, they didn't lose too much time. The period when there seemed to be some dramas. As the doll is out for this car as well. So this is the 98 car. This car's going in the garage too. So we are in a period where all of a sudden... All sorts of dramas. A uh, drama that's been spotted by Nicholas Smith on Twitter uh, has befallen the number 91 Porsche. And that car, loss of power steering, has been in for repairs and back out now. As but well. But he's back in again, in fact. So, so power so steering issue for both the worked indeed. Porsches. So the 91 car, uh, in for attention to power steering, out, back in again. That's Trevor Foster, who manages the LMP2 programme, managing the efforts of the rear of the car. The gentleman with the visible white lanyard. 98 car in the garage, 91 car in the garage. It's Le Mans bingo all of a sudden again. Amazing race of attrition, as we've been saying before. Well, yes, and all of a sudden... So what are they looking at on the Aston Martin? We've got a camera inside the garage here. We've got having a brake, disc and caliper change. Look at how they are prepared to change the whole unit. It's incredible now to the, see. The, the point here, though, is that is that cool uh, the issue yeah. or are they just doing it because they know they've got to do something else? We saw that, if you remember, with... What? Was it on the Ferraris earlier in the evening? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, th I, I think I think you're right. I think that's it's a job that they were going to do, and they're just getting it done now. But they're looking at the rear end of it's not brakes, is it? It's under the rear of the end, yeah. end of the car. So they've got concern over what's the gearbox, gearbox around there? Yeah, and that's that's the kind of area. And that it will take for the moment that 98 car out of contention uh, for. Race victory in GT Am, and really 
hand the advantage for the moment to Charlie Eastwood uh, in the TF Sport Aston Martin, who has a four and a half minute advantage to Matt Campbell in the Dempsey Proton Porsche. That's and a 77 car. So it's now from being, well, convincingly dominant for the Aston Martin. Max Martins. Martin, driver of car number 97 for Aston Martin Racing. So, Max, there's a real battle going on up top there with you and the AF Corsa, car number 51. Let's tell us from your perspective what it's like. Yeah, it's 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 good fight. Um, the night is quite long, so it's uh, it's a big push in the night with the traffic. Uh, it's, it's not always easy, um, but at, at the moment everything is going well. Uh, car is very good in, in 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 the night. We have we are running with the soft tires and. Is running really good, so at the moment, no, no issues. Yeah, it seems to be really working for you. I saw you talking to Ludovic from Michelin. What, what, what were you saying? Yeah, because uh, strangely, we, we tried a lot of times the soft tires, and uh, it never really worked for us. And, um, and it switched on for the race here th this night. So um, at the moment, it's really working well, so really happy with the soft tires, actually. With a few hours left of the race to go, what's your strategy? Push, push, push? Yeah, I mean, when you see the gaps, uh, I don't think we have a lot of a lot of things we can do uh, except pushing. So we, yeah, we push, we push quite hard. I, of course, is pushing hard also. Uh, we are a bit ups, uh, offset in uh, in strategy with the tire changes. So uh, sometimes they pass us, sometimes we pass them. Uh, so it's 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 good. It's great battle. Um, it's still long. It's still long. So we we keep pushing. Good to head down to the pits there with uh, Haley. If a little bit uh, surprising, um, she managed to turn herself on there. Uh, not quite sure what happened, but uh, just to reiterate uh, his points, Daniel Serra still owes us a pit stop in the Air Course 51 that now uh, effectively leads. Once that pit stop is done, Harry Tinknell will go back into uh, the lead of the race. He's now aboard the 97 at Aston Martin. It's marginal. It's marginal. If there's a full service stop required, it's going to be very close. There isn't. It's only a short stop. Ah, right. OK, so it's, it's going to be fairly close. We, we're talking, uh, you know, handfuls of seconds. GT Pro has been close through the night. Well, frankly, through the race. Yeah, the gap, I think when I came back on air, the gap was about 14, 15 seconds. Uh, but, as, uh, but there is this offset. Interestingly, though, uh, there is an offset in terms of when they're pitting, but they seem to be going now onto the same uh, strategy in that we are the last. Well, no, actually, I, I, I lie. The last stop from the Aston Martin was a full service. The next stop from the Ferrari is not a full service, we right. expect. Okay. So. Uh, also, watching what's going on in this uh, LMP2 battle on board at the moment. The number 90 TF Sports Aston Martin and Anthony Davidson is on a charge. He is taking time out of Phil Hansen. That gap is going to be under a minute. In the pits, James Allen for So24 by Graf. He's had one heck of a race, hasn't he, that young man? Yeah, but we did see him have a loop uh, at the second chicane uh, about an hour, an hour and a half ago. Um, we were talking him up as uh, he had a little spin. Uh, is it because you were talking him up? Probably. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, Antoine Borger in the cool racing in seventh position, also in the pit. So fifth, sixth and seventh in LMP2, all in the pit lane. We've got two cars now on the lead lap with uh, Phil Hansen leading Antti Davidson by one minute. And then a lap down is Panis Racing's Max Vosilier and being chased down by Roman Rusinov, the G-Drive car recovering after a throttle sensor issue. Yeah, that was... Uh Catastrophic couple of laps, wasn't it, for the 26 car? And team. it could have just been one lap. It, the team not ready is what we're told. Oh, uh, uh, my guess, it may be not ready to diagnose what the issue was. They're yeah. maybe trying to work it out, but it turned out... Still I think trying it, to turn the it, computer on. It was a mistake to leave that car out for another lap uh, because he had to stop and restart the car three times on that lap. And dangerous, quite yeah. a car aside from anything else. But uh, So that car that was in contention for the lead dropping back, but now recovering courtesy of this ongoing problem. Still in the pits, Jan van uh, The G-Drive car now back up to fourth. 
nearly, what is that, a minute and 20 seconds, a minute and 17 seconds back from the Panis Racing car. Fib Hansen in pits as well, so that's th these early. are all... Is it early still, Peter? Or are we at the full 10 laps 22. now? Uh, um, Phil Hansen? Yeah. That can't be 10 laps. 